Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm very honored to be joined by Jill Mueller, who's a physiotherapist and pain coach with a focus in pelvic pain and endometriosis. So thanks for being here today, Jill. Oh my gosh, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to finally chat in person. Yes, and we've been we've talked back and forth lots, yeah. probably over it has to be well over a year at this point. I think so. Yeah. Um, and I know I really like your Instagram account just because there's a lot of similarities in, in the work that we do. I know we're in different professions, but they're converging. Uh, I know I something. love that. Yeah. So, you know, I'm really excited today to talk about kind of the areas that you focus on. But what I wanted to start off with is how did you become interested in treating endometriosis or pelvic pain? Like how did that journey kind of develop for you? Yeah, I was a ortho physio, physio like your typical sports injury physio for many years, like 15, yeah. 17 years. And then I had my own journey with endometriosis. So I have it myself and it involved a lot of uh, like surgery and uh, fertility challenges for many years, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it was really after that, that I learned about pain science for my clients, because yeah. I didn't realize that I was somebody with chronic pain because of the cyclical event of it. So I didn't even put two and two together, started to implement those strategies on myself. And that's when I actually got out of pain entirely. Surgery didn't work. Medications didn't work, which I hear commonly with my patients with endometriosis. So I really took that opportunity to realize, okay, maybe there's something here where my experience and then diving into the pain science side of things and understanding it. And that's when I shifted into pelvic health and really wanting to help people with endometriosis. Wow. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, it sounds like the, a lot that you went through. And and I know you're really passionate about this topic um, just based on some of your posts. And I know you do a lot for kind of the endometriosis like community that's mm -hmm. going on. And so let's kind of break this down here. So when you're when you're treating endometriosis, what are like the standard line, like treatments that are out there? Well, there is the gold standard of treatment and that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best treatment for everyone, but that is the only way to diagnose it, diag diagnose it is by a laparoscopy, which is a surgery with these little keyholes. They go in, they see, they yeah. take a snippet they send that to um, get to see if there is the disease of endometriosis. But the treatment yeah. actually is also a laparoscopy surgery. And the ideal, the gold standard is excision surgery, which is actually where they cut out the endometriotic tissue versus ablation, which is when they just burn it off or cut it off. So they want to get the whole disease out. A lot of times it's yeah. treated medically, which means they will put people into a, a medical menopause to suppress the disease. So endometriosis is, is tissue that is similar to the endometrial lining, the endometrial lining, the lining of the uterus, but it is not the same. The, rate, the way it's this similar is that it will respond to those ebbs and flows hormonally where the lesions themselves will become more active and inflamed, usually during someone's period, not always, but most likely during their period. Mm -hmm. So they, they like to use medical means to kind of suppress those ebbs and flows. But that medication, again, comes with its own, a lot of times side effects, can have an effect on our bone health, our heart health. So there, these may be sort of the, the traditional medical means but my passion lies in where the science is in the pain science standpoint. We'll talk about it, but um, that is a big missing piece in the medical system. I 
I think, and that is what research is showing too. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of have like the, and I feel like with any condition, there's kind of the gold standard, but as we know, like surgeries, medications, things of this nature, like have, you know, not, not as effective as people believe Yeah, uh, for like a variety of conditions. And so yes. I know, I know your passion very much is in the pain science and utilizing that into your approach. So what does that really look like when, when you're working with someone? Like, is it just like a lot of education that's being provided around how pain actually works? It really depends on the patient's capacity when they come in to see me in terms of the amount of information I'm giving. If they're really overwhelmed, I might help to really kind of bring them back into that rest and digest state so that they can absorb that information. But it is generally a lot of education. I kind of look for, um, in general, what I do is try and get them to have a different relationship with their body because their body has been a disappointment to them to this point. And it just constantly is giving them pain. And I try and educate them that pain is a, a messenger And it's not to be, uh, their body isn't out to get them. So I try and really try and reframe their understanding of the messages of the body, really. And then I kind of look for five patterns that I've started to notice with people with endometriosis specifically. And that goes into um, fascial mobility. So I am sort of taking a whole person approach, which is what's missing in the medical system. You know, if we have problems with our uterus, we're going to a gynecologist. If we have digestive issues, we're going to a GI doc. If we have bladder issues, a urologist. It's very separated in the medical system. And we might have overlapping symptoms when we have endometriosis most of the time. So I think pelvic physio and physiotherapists and your occupation as well, we can take a whole person approach. We can look at how is this affecting you as a whole person? And so these five sort of things that I'm noticing are the bio or the physical parts. So fascial mobility and, you know, so we can use our hands on internally and externally to see how is the digestive system working? How are things moving in, in your pelvis? Is your uterus moving well? That sort of thing. And not everybody has those skills, but but I've taken um, fascial mobilization courses so we can check that. The second thing I look for is a conditioned response. So is their period routine in and of itself causing pain, which is like a Pavlovian response. So, you know, like Pavlov taught his dog, like would feed the dog and ring a bell every time. And eventually the dog started to salivate when it heard the bell. So is their routine, they get out the hot pack, does the brain know, oh, pain is, comes with this hot pack. And so that's been an interesting thing to evaluate with people and just changing that period routine for them. The third thing I look for is something called sensory motor dysregulation, which we have a map of the body on the brain and we can get um, sort of smudging in certain areas when we've had pain for a long time. And if you've heard of phantom limb pain, we can literally have no limb, no tissue issue and have pain where that limb was. And the reason is because we have a map of the body on the brain. And so there's ways for me to check, to see if that there is some smudging in that area. And the brain doesn't like when things aren't clear geographically in that that body area so remapping that could be something useful and then the two things that you probably also look at are what Lorimer Mosley one of the big biggest pain researchers in in physiotherapy and in the research world of pain talks about pain system hypersensitivity or central sensitization so when it's more of that 
neuroplastic pain, as you call it, nociplastic pain. There's lots of different words for it, but when it's more a central pain mechanism than it is the tissue itself. And there's ways that we can assess for that. And then the treatment is obviously different than staying in the tissues. And then the last thing I look for, last but not least, is like a pain worry cycle. And the way we assess that is looking at, um, or the way I assess that is looking using the pain, um, the pain PCS, the pain, oh my gosh, what is it? pain catastrophizing scale. I try and stay away from that word, which is why it's not top of mind, because patients yeah. don't love to hear that word. No, not a great um, word. Yeah, it's not a great word in the lay no. people, but but basically it's when you get caught in a worry cycle. And that's the antidote to that is it is mostly understanding pain and how pain works, because tissue is just one data point that could be contributing to the pain as an output. So that's a long-winded answer. No, but... I, I like it. it. It was very thorough in the areas you're kind of looking at. Mm -hmm. like you're treating someone, and I know this is why uh, we've communicated back and forth because there's crossover uh, mm -hmm. between our professions and what we're doing when we're treating someone, um, whether it be pelvic pain or, or chronic pain in general. Um, you're right. I think a big thing that people it's hard to wrap your head around is those mm -hmm. condition responses, as you mentioned. Yeah. It's, it's hard for people to, to separate those out. And, and we don't need to separate them. Like there's going to be overlap. Yes. It's I, I say to the person, it's just like, where are we going to get the biggest bang for our buck or what is within your capacity to address right now? Because if I'm looking at all those five things and only three are relevant to them, then I'm like, let's not even look at these two. But of these three, which one's within your capacity right now? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're right. Like those, you know, those condition responses are tricky, but I think they're, for, for some people, there can be a lot of effect in terms of working with that. And and working on breaking those condition responses that have taken yeah. place. So the brain has interpreted danger for, for so long. It's become associated with all these different things that are in a person's routine. Um, and that's what the brain's job is all about. Is like, hey, yeah. this happened in the past. I'm going to help you this time. Right? But then it can work against us. It's like it's trying to make associations all the time. And it's when those associations in and of themselves become a routine that, that maybe it's not helpful. So it's just a matter of seeing, is this helpful, not helpful? And then you can have fun with it. Yeah. Yeah. You can kind of experiment with it, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which that's how, that's always the wording. I don't know what wording you use, but that's the wording I always give people is like, like yeah. we're playing around with it. We're experimenting with it to see what the effect's going to be by mixing it up over time. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other piece is, yeah, it's kind of that, that pain fear cycle, of course, mm -hmm. and just a malfunction in, in the pain system. Yeah. That's specifically happening. And so when you're working with people, you know, you have a number of areas, five areas you're kind of assessing for and looking at, but what do you find in terms of effects for people when they've tried medication, they've tried surgery, and now they're coming to, to some degree, and not fully, but partly a mind-body approach to, to mm -hmm. treating the pain uh, as more of like a brain and nervous system issue potentially, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. what, what's the effectiveness you've kind of found for people with endometriosis in starting to treat the pain in that way? Well, the interesting thing is there's actually even research in the endometriosis population, wow. which is so cool. Yeah. It's been done. It, okay, so I'll shout out to Natasha Orr and Paul Young. So Natasha Orr is a researcher and Paul Young is an, um, a gynecologist with a focus in um, endometriosis. And he's also an associate professor, both of them out in BC at BC wow. Women's Health or BC Women's Hospital, and yeah. they've done research where they use that central sensitization inventory, so looking for that pain system hypersensitivity 
and using the PCS, so the pain catastrophizing score, that cycle of worry about pain, those when they did those um, questionnaires, they were predictive of who wouldn't respond well to medication and who would come out, who is more at risk of coming out of, an, of surgery still in pain, which to you and I makes sense, right? Because yeah, sure. if it's a yeah. central nervous system driven pain system, it's not, you're not going to be able to pull it, uh, do surgery on that. So yes. what they propose is that the doctor's screen using those questionnaires and you treat the neuroplastic, as you call it, nociplastic pain system, hypersensitivity, yeah. whatever you want to call it, central pain mechanisms. There's so many yeah. words for it. There's so many names. Yeah. So many names. But basically, if we can see that that is dominating the pain system, we need to calm that down. So that if when they go into surgery, if they still need it, then they will come out with a better recovery. So I'm not anti-medical. Yeah. I'm all about let's optimize this. And if we can optimize this before you go in for surgery, or if this is a reason. So yes, to your question, I am seeing people who are who are still suffering post-surgically and um, with medication, but I'm now getting people referred before surgery by these doctors with a, uh, who, with a focus in endometriosis, especially from McMaster Hospital in Hamilton, because I have a good relationship with them. So yeah. now I'm working with people pre-surgically, which is kind of cool. Uh, that is really cool, actually. Um, right? And I think... I hope the listeners understand like how big of a deal that is. Um, Huge. Because the amount, what you could prevent. And I, and I, I'll give you context. What, what I'm thinking of that that's very related to this. I did last year around this time, I did um, some presentations. I know you do lots of presentations too, but I did some presentations with back surgeons and, shoulder surgeons and, and different things that were pretty fascinated about this, this area, like kind of what we're talking about here. Yeah. And, and I remember, I think it was one of the back surgeons had stated, I wonder if people did this kind of approach first, how much, how many would actually make it to needing back surgery? I mean, you and I know that answer based on yeah. statistics. <laughs> we do, we do like, you know, back surgery I, and, and you know you're much better but it's fairly similar across the board like back surgery it can be really good at improving function we know that but mm -hmm. it's not really good at reducing pain um, and, and in extreme examples of course it can be like there are cases of that but yeah like i that's exciting that you were you have the opportunity right now to work people pre-surgery yeah, so uh, we work. need to, I think we need more of this. And so I do teach a course for practitioners, specifically in endometriosis, but to teach them how we can help pre surgically to increase or to improve that recovery time. Yeah. And there's a lot. I mean, I think in Canada, at least it takes so long to get surgery, we have an opportunity to do this. Yes. It's just a matter of getting to more of these doctors to say, hey, send them ahead of time to your point, And this is what we can work on to optimize the outcome, right? And the research is there. The research is there for disc herniations, disc bulges, and uh, osteoarthritis even. You can have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. And yeah. what somebody is seeing radiologically on these imaging on on x-rays or MRIs does not coincide with someone's pain experience. So somebody can have a lot of bone on bone. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what people don't understand. You can have a lot of arthritis and very little to no pain, but the same thing happens with endometriosis. And we know this, somebody can have a lot of endometriosis and little to no pain and not know anything about it until they try and have a baby, for example. Yeah. So it's, the, the disease itself is not everything. No, it's not. 
and and yeah i think it's it's opening up slowly people's openness i guess or opinion of this but it is it is slow it is slow um there are many people that don't think that education or treating your nervous system or potentially like reducing your emotional response to symptoms could have an effect um but but the research is catching up. That's the that's the beautiful part of both and the exciting part. Which I, I feel like the research is there. I know, I I know, know the it's research, been there. The research yeah. isn't even new. This is yeah. what drives me crazy. I know because if you look at like those studies on like MRIs um, and back and not lining up, like there's so many studies that are have been done on that. And those those studies are decades old. Like it's it, it's a long way. Um, but I think an exciting part, wh- which I was referring to is now some of the treatments, like I know, like pain reprocessing therapy is yeah. getting more ground. Um, yeah. some of Dr. Schubiner's work is gaining more headway in terms of like being published in major journals, which is great because I think there's, it's been known for a long time that there's this gap where the treatments aren't being effective but now we're starting to get ground in terms of the treatments actually getting like research. Yeah, I agree because in physiotherapy, for example, there's not a lot of great research. When I read that Colorado back study, I was so excited. Yeah. Cause it's like you said, making the segue from, okay, we know that if you have central pain mechanisms that can make you higher risk of not doing well with medication, not doing well with surgery but then it just ends there so to your point it's like but here's now implementing some strategies that help to treat that that is starting to have a good outcome and that's what we needed you're right yeah and it's and it's interesting it'll be it'll be interesting over the next decade how much i and i think there will be a push towards like meeting the need um yeah of this and, and we kind of, I, I'm talking about my world specifically, even with, um, you know, like we talk about trauma, uh, of course we all know it's, it's highly related, you know, books like the body keeps the score. Like we, we've known this for a long time that, yeah. that that's, what's taking place. But mm-hmm. now we're starting to see effective treatments that potentially can have an effect on that. And it's been proven. And I think, that is going to open the public's opinion up of some of these approaches because lots of people you talk to have known their pains, no C plastic or neuroplastic for decades, but every treatment they tried, it just wasn't being effective. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of exciting that, that the treatment side of things is starting to grow. Yeah. And I actually have, there's a uh, pelvic pain program at, at McMaster and I have a few patients who have, gone to that yeah. and that's a group program so they're learning about pain and they and they really kind of get it at a cognitive level but then i'll see them and i said okay now we need to ap- apply it to you yeah. and uh, look at your nuances and that's where we can kind of individualize it and that's where i find that somatic work super helpful or the you, looking at if it's a condition response, because they don't talk about that sort of stuff in the pelvic pain program. You're just more learning, understanding pain as a general rule, which is great. Um, It's a great start. But if you come out and you're like still cognitive and you're like, okay, I understand this, but it's almost like, okay, now let's apply it to the body. Right. Yeah. There's like this, this application that needs to take effect. Um, Yeah. Because, yeah, even in Alberta, in public health, there's lots of programs that teach you about pain. Yeah. Um, and they're accurate. Like, like I've, I've seen some of their work. They're, it's accurate stuff. But then there's no kind of follow through of like, okay, how do we apply this yeah. to your life to take an effect? Yeah. So on that point, I know you're training in somatic experiencing, which is exciting. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask how you're kind of applying that to your approach um, as a physiotherapist and and pain coach? 
so it's interesting. I mean, the reason I liked somatic just means body. Anybody who's watching your channel yeah. knows now what it means. Um, but the the thing I like about it is that it it is within our scope of practice because it is kind of reading the nervous system through the body as opposed to any more of the cognitive stuff is out is more in your this is where there's an overlap between your profession and my profession which i like overlap because then if i do have patients where i'm like okay this is a a bit beyond physio but i can talk to it enough where it means something to them and they are more likely to go see someone like you yeah. whereas if it comes from most practitioners, me included, before I knew this, it, it could be taken as like, it's all in your head, right? Yes. Which we don't want our clients. No. Yeah. To, that's not the message we want them to leave with, right? So if we can both talk about it and overlap, I think that's a good thing, right? But the somatic experience, like I said before, a lot of people with endometriosis, their body has been nothing but a disappointment and pain to them. So the way I have sort of seen a pattern with, with the people who are coming to me with physical pain is to perhaps bring the calmness outside of the body to start with. The awareness of what brings them calm may have to start outside of the body and then letting them recognize that that is a bit of calm and titrating into that calm because calm in and of itself may not feel safe to them. Exactly. Yeah. It's been a long time, maybe, maybe never. Yeah. And then we, once they be, their nervous system gets more familiar with that rest and digest state, then I might create a, like, maybe we do a little bit of bodies, bringing it into the body, but maybe even externally where they're like putting something soft and their hand means nothing to them, for example, whereas their belly does. So it's like, oh, this is soft or something else is hard or a balloon is kind of sticky. Like, so then they're, they're aware of sensation, but it's not in and then we kind of titrate into a like it's, it can happen in different ways, but I think the main difference of my, the population coming to see me is that it's body pain and being in the body is a threat. That's the, the thing I notice when I go to the courses with a lot of psychotherapists, yeah. they might have a body pain, but it's emotional, maybe emotional. I'm stereotyping, yeah. but, <laughs> but that I, I find that an interesting thing that, the body we can't come straight into the body a lot of times you're right um, yeah and i think that's a it takes it takes time like for some people it can be it can be relatively quick of course we've both seen that but a lot of times like it is like we we need to develop this different relationship with our body mm -hmm. and sometimes that's as you said, like connecting with outside senses at first, right? Like things mm -hmm. outside the body, learning to attend and seeing what happens. Yeah. But I think it, it's hard when people, and I think especially with people um, with trauma, when you, when you tie that in, um, the body's already seen as a threat because there's pain somewhere, right? Yeah. So it's like we're fighting against it. We're avoiding everything we can to live up, neck up, to not be in the body. Yeah. Then if, if people feel also unsafe to feel calm or joy or love or these things that we more view as like positive, pleasant things, then there's nowhere to go. It, it becomes this really difficult thing that people can work through, of course. Um, but yeah, like it can start with, yeah, just like slowly tapping your body or slowly starting to get connected with things that feel even just a little bit more neutral or safe to them. Yeah. I think the biggest take home lesson that I've learned in that course is that calm may not feel safe for people mm -hmm. or mo maybe, maybe because it's just unfamiliar. It could be as simple as that. 
that was my case. I was like, oh, I, I, I couldn't tell if I was tired, if I was bored. All I noticed is that my nervous system was like, I feel like I should be doing something. And then I was like, is this calm? Yeah. I, like I could not label it. So I just, I get people to just be like, almost like training for a marathon. You can't just go out and run a marathon if our calm state is like the physical marathon running equivalent. We have to just gently train to get into that calm state. And when I explain it that way, people are like, oh, and I said, and if you're the pattern is it wants to flip out and go in, you know, like not flip out, but like jump out and go back to that fight or flight state. Just note it. Don't don't get angry that you can't stay in that calm state because there's so much shame around that. Right. There is. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was a big aha moment for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really it's a useful point to understand because I even think about when I was doing therapy earlier in my career. You know, it's like, oh, the goal is to get calm. But then people would get there and like skip out right away because it's just it's it can be equally as overwhelming for people and you're right i'm familiar to kind of yeah. sit there and eventually we want to get there like we need to have a state of calmness well that's and, where homeostasis lies and all exactly. our body functioning right and yeah. socialization and yeah joy and yeah yeah, yeah. And, to, and to feel connected like we need we need this to take place and so one thing i appreciated about your approach is um, and, and in terms of the somatic experiencing, like you, you are very nervous system focused as mm -hmm. you're working with someone, which is needed. Like it's, it's near impossible to get out of pain if we're constantly in fight or flight or shut down. It's, it's yeah. a really hard task at hand. And it doesn't mean you can't go there. Sometimes we all, we all have our moments. That's, that's typical. It's needed. Um, yeah. But we need that, that safe, connected, calm energy to be part of part of our nervous system as well yeah, yeah. well i i really appreciate uh, you spending the time doing this interview with me jill so um, it's always enlightening talking to you uh, i always learn new things and so oh, i know yeah. yeah i know my viewers would will will have learned a lot from this and yeah. i wanted to just mention in terms of you know, kind of the services you offer. Um, I know some are probably province specific of mm -hmm. when you offer them, but tell us a little bit about that. And of course I'll link everything to the description of the video. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm on Instagram, as you mentioned, it's under yeah. at endo together. I co-own a clinic in Oakville, Ontario called healthy balance physiotherapy and wellness. But I am licensed everywhere in Ontario, so there's a lot we can do virtually. I think that's an underutilized means of um, getting this information, especially with physio. Uh, people think physio has to be in person. It yeah. doesn't. There's a lot we can do. And then I also have an online course that I'm, I've had a beta group go through uh to help with the retraining of the nervous system especially for people with endometriosis and i'm going to be officially launching that in march i wanted to give myself some time it's done but i'm i'm a, ref a recovering perfectionist so there's some things like based <laughs> on re on the feedback from the beta testers that i'm just like jigging around and i want to give myself some time to do that so for march uh, which is endometriosis awareness month. I'm going to be launching that. So if Amazing. you, yeah, if you want to get on that wait list, it's on my website, which is www.endotogether.com and, or just DM me and I'll send you that information. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's amazing. So I'll put all that information in the description so people have it. Cool. And thank you again for joining, uh, this meeting with me today. Thank and you. Thank you everyone for listening and watching this video. And I will talk to you all next week.